Amen. Today is one of the uh, tough passages, I think. At least it will be <laughs> when I'm done with it. Um, but, you know, the reality is, is that, it, you know, we started this a long time ago, back when I preached to you the book of Malachi. And at the end of Malachi, it talked about all these things that are happening in the world and will continue to happen in the world. And then we went through Matthew and followed Matthew as it was talking right about the same thing with Malachi. Now Paul has picked up that story of Malachi and he's bringing it to life here in the story as we come to Thessalonians, as he's walking with Jesus through the epistles. And then ultimately we move to John. And uh, John, we move to his epistles and then we move to Revelation and one day, It'll be great news. But before we get to that great news, we have to accept sometimes not so great news, and that's where we are today with Paul's letter uh, to the Thessalonians. You know, when you look at today's news, it's easy to get anxious about all the, you know, widespread evil that's in this world. And when you look at all the calamities and disasters and all the chaos and all the destruction, you know, you begin to wonder, where is God in all this? And is God really in control? You know, in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul says that at the climax of history, at the climax of history, the most powerful, hideously evil ruler ever will gain worldwide following. But says Paul, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Because it's all part of of God's prophetic plan. My friends, God is in control. God is sovereign. We just need to learn to trust him and be faithful to him. Now, the church in Thessalonica came to believe a bogus prophecy that was falsely attributed to Paul that said that the second coming of Christ had already occurred. And these people were absolutely, you know, fit to be tied. They were in distress. They were anxious. They were still here. And so Paul said, this is the problem with false beliefs. This is the problem when you don't believe God's word. Because false beliefs will deeply affect your life. And they can lead to anxiety. And then they can make a person vulnerable to even more and deeper and further deception. Thus, solid biblical study, solid biblical doctrine is essential in shaping your worldview. Because, my friends, it's your worldview that shapes your decisions, your plans, and how you will live your life. In the parable of the wise and foolish builders in Matthew 7, it is said that the wise man who built his house on a rock is like the one who hears God's word and does it. So that when the storms hit in your life, and they will, when your house is built on the rock, Jesus Christ, he guarantees you that your life will stand firm. That foundation cannot be shaken. But Matthew says, if we build our lives on worldly values or beliefs, no matter how good they may sound, or if we build our lives at anything other than God's word, my friends, we're building our lives our foundation on shifting sand. Only God's truth will ever enable you to experience any true peace and calm in the midst of the trials that will come in your life. In 2 Thessalonians 2.3, Paul speaks about the mystery of lawlessness and specifically about the man of lawlessness. Now, it's important to note that Paul's teaching here is on the end times, and these end times are a direct reflection on the teaching of Jesus in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 that we talked about a few weeks ago. Now, Paul says that before Jesus returns, three things need to happen. First, there's going to be unprecedented evil apostasy and lawlessness. Second, the man of lawlessness will be revealed. But third, before he can be revealed, God, God must remove this retainer or the restrainer that's holding that man of lawlessness back. 
In verses 4 through 9, Paul gives a description of this man of lawlessness so that Christians will be able to recognize him when he appears on the scene and not be fooled. Apostasy refers to a falling away of those who formally profess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Uh, From the earliest times of the church, false teachers have always plagued the church. But Jesus said in Matthew 24 that just before his return, we can expect a tsunami of apostasy and false teachings in the world and in the church. And my friends, it's coming to a church near you. Are you prepared to stand on God's word in the midst of the tsunami? My friends, Satan uses frontal attacks, those of persecution and trials and tribulations. And Satan also uses subtler attacks, attacks of false teaching to try to lead believers astray. And Jesus said, Satan's a powerful, powerful enemy, and the love of many will grow cold. But those who endure to the end will be saved. Now, I'm still foolish enough to believe in the freedom of speech. Because the founding fathers, the framers of our Constitution, believed in free speech. And they believed the importance of separating the church and the state because they came out of a world which the church was a state church. And the government informed that church. They didn't want that. They wanted separation of church and state because they understood something important. The responsibility of the church is that they are to be the moral conscience of the government. And we are to hold the government accountable to the truth, God's truth, God's word. And if ever the government begins to silence the church, the church is in trouble. It will become apostate. It will be an apostasy. And so I share this with you this morning because there's a, there is a bill that just got passed in the House, H.R. 5, is it? H.R. 5? And it's going to go to the Senate. Now, this bill sounds really... You know, good. It's about equality. It's good stuff, equality. It's going to go to the Senate. If it passes the Senate, it'll go to the president's desk, and the president will sign this. Now, the problem is that this bill may not intend to shut down Christianity or the church or religion or any of those kinds of things, but this is how Satan subtly works. If this bill passes... I guarantee you one thing, the evangelical church is going to have its voice silenced. You know, it's going to be to preach the whole counsel of God's word, you are going to be in conflict with the state. If you choose to preach the whole counsel of God's word, then what you're going to find is that you're going to risk, you're going to risk persecution you're going to risk, you know, coming up against the state's morals and values. You need to take things like this serious because this is how Satan works in our lives. And he's very active. And this is the kinds of things that Jesus is warning about, these things of lawlessness that begin to come into the world. And, you know, people say it can't happen. Come on, this is America. It's the land of the free. We haven't lost our freedom of speech. We haven't lost any of these things. This can't happen. You know, it was only 80 years ago that the, at that time, the most powerful government in the world silenced the church. It silenced the confessing church. It didn't silence the church. It let the state church speak the apostasy. But it silenced the confessing church, those who believe the entirety of God's word. But I want to tell you about an even greater thing. You see... You know, this has gone on throughout history where the world has tried to silence the church. It's not, it's not the governments. It's Satan working within the government, subtly destroying the church. But I want to tell you about the greatest disaster ever, 2,000 years ago.
God's chosen people, Israel, they were given by God personally his word. They were given God's word. They were given God's perfect laws to protect and share them to the world, to be the light to the world, just as we are today, to proclaim the whole counsel of God to the world. They began to so much destroy God's word. They began to fill God's word with all sorts of falsity. They began to, you know, move more and more towards apostasy. It got so bad. These very religious people, the most religious people in the world, God's chosen people, that when God himself came and stood in their midst, they tried to silence him. When he spoke the word, when he spoke the law, they tried to silence him. And when that didn't work, God's chosen people killed him. Don't say it can't happen. Don't say the church cannot be silenced. We need to be very careful in this world because Satan is powerful and he is subtly working through all these things. I'm just calling you to take serious note of what's going on in this country, what's going on in the world. You know, now Paul's man of lawlessness and John's antichrist is the very same person. And when John speaks about the coming Antichrist, he says that before the final Antichrist comes, there are going to be many Antichrists. And there have been many Antichrists. You go all the way back to the Roman Empire, and you got Nero, you got Caligula, you got Domitian, you've got Domitian, you've got Hitler, you've got all of these different people, Lenin and Stalin. They have all been Antichrists. One thing they had in common silence the church. My friends, the Antichrist, Satan is behind him. And Satan is a powerful, powerful spiritual being who wants to destroy God's church. And so there's going to be lawlessness on and on. It will be over and over, just like there's many Antichrists. Until the day the final Antichrist, this man of lawlessness, is revealed. He will be empowered by Satan. And Satan's power will be revealed in the fact that this man will be able to do signs and false wonders. These are real miracles, folks. They're real miracles because Satan can describe and disguise himself as a child of light. And these are real miracles. And they will lead people astray who are not sold and living the word of God. He will lead people into lawlessness and rebellion. He will oppose and exalt himself above everything that God stands for. And he will set himself up in the temple of God. You know, this may very well refer to the church. The church becoming apostate by believing that the man of lawlessness is the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, because he's going to bring peace. Initially, he's going to be somebody who can draw countries together and people together initially, and then comes a rebellion, and then comes a lawlessness. But says Paul, those who love God's truth, those who know Jesus Christ and are faithful will not be fooled, but they will be persecuted. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 says that because people refuse to love the truth, God will send a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie and that the man of lawlessness is, in fact, the Messiah. And when they believe that lie, they'll fall under God's judgment. My friends, God knows our hearts, and our hearts always show us what we truly desire. They cannot lie to God. God can't be deceived. God clearly sees the hearts and the secret delights of our hearts. He sees whether we are pursuing 
righteousness or unrighteousness. He sees whether we truly love the pleasures of the world or God's holiness and God's word. Romans 1.21 says that God ultimately will allow us to pursue what our hearts most deeply desire. And thus sin is not just what we do, but what we truly want. Judgment isn't lightning bolts. Judgment is God turning us over to the desires of our hearts. I believe there's a time coming when the power will be given to the Antichrist and all who bear the mark of the Lamb will suffer for a period of time until Jesus Christ returns. And then, my friends, those tables will be reversed. The bottom line is this. The gospel either melts our hearts and permeates our living, or it doesn't. There is no middle ground. Either you love and obey God's word, or you don't. There is no middle ground. Our hearts will either pursue pleasure or holiness, period. We are either being prepared for the lamb, or we are being prepared for the beast. There is no middle ground. 2 Thessalonians says that the man of lawlessness will not be revealed until God chooses, God chooses to remain the restrainer, to remove the restrainer. In other words, there is something active in the world today, as there's always been something active. And be it the true church, be it the Holy Spirit, something God is using to hold back the Antichrist. At some point in history, God's going to remove that restrainer. If it's the church, what will happen is the confessing church will be hushed. And only the apostate church, the church that speaks for the state, will still exist. If it's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will just quiet himself. He will just turn us over to the desires of our heart. But something in the world today is keeping things under control. One day God will remove that and lawlessness will come. And when the lawlessness comes, so will the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. But never forget this. God is sovereign and God is in control. And in his time and his choosing, he will remove that restrainer. Only then will the man of lawlessness appear on the world stage. Now, interestingly, Paul taught the Thessalonians who or what that restrainer was to be. Unfortunately, Paul doesn't tell us what he told them. What Paul does say is that when this man of lawlessness comes, those who love God's truth won't be deceived. Second Thessalonians and Revelation were not written to scare you. They were not written to cause you to lose sleep or to dread the future. My friends, Paul and John are telling you the good news. God is in control. God loves you. God is faithful. God is for you. And there's nothing in all creation greater than the creator. And he loves you. That's good news. In fact, that's great news. Secondly, you know, God wins. Read the book. God wins. No matter how much evil in the world, how much sin in the world, in the end, God wins. That's not just good news, friends. That's great news. And if that's great news, I'll tell you even greater news. Because God wins, God is going to bring all of those who are faithful to his home of glory. That means you and me. Where do we get these amens? Where? You know, come on. This is great news. You have to walk through the clouds. You have to walk through the shadows. But then the light will shine, folks. And it's great news. It's glory coming. And you'll be on that train of glory if you walk faithfully in God's word. My friends, that's the gospel. That's the extension of John 3.16. That is the truth of God's word. 
The only question is, are you willing to live, believe that truth? Are you willing to proclaim that truth? Are you willing to stand on that truth? Because if you are, I guarantee you this, God will be with you. That spirit of God will be with you. He will guide you. He will comfort you. He will strengthen you. And I don't care how many trials or tribulations you go, go through, Jesus Christ will be there with you. And I guarantee you this, he will bring each and every one of us who remains faithful to his word, to his glory. My friends, he's coming, and he's coming for us. And he's coming to judge, to judge the Antichrist. And there's an amazing thing in here. When you read this story, you know, it tells us that when Jesus Christ comes again, that this Antichrist, as powerful and as deceptive, deceptive as he might be, when Jesus comes again, you know what? He'll destroy him by the sheer word of his mouth. You know, we have these stories of all the armies of the world gathering and all this these bloodshed that, you know, that rises up to the bridle of horses spreading over the world. My friends, God, God who is the creator of the universe, do you know how he created this universe and those millions of galaxies and stars? Read the Bible by his word. Let there be light, and there was light. And that's how he'll take Satan out, by the breath of his mouth. Boom! The Antichrist will be gone, and Satan and his angels will be cast in the deepest pits of hell. That's not just good news, friends. That's great news. And next week, we'll begin to tell you the rest of the story. Because, my friends, that's even greater news. Because Jesus Christ wins. And so do all of us who walk with Jesus. Amen. Amen.